It's another episode of the VD Clinic. I'm your chilly host, Vanessa, and my probably also chilly, although I don't know, are you warmer than me <laughs> today? Uh, Co host, Darren. How are you, Darren? I'm doing all right. Hi, Cockadoodie Brats. How are you doing? It is somewhere between 20 and 30 degrees Fahrenheit here. I don't know. Um, I, yeah, I think that's, we're about the same. Ah, all right. Although yeah. we've got, well, the wind is going to, is coming back. Oof. Yeah, the Cleveland uh, train is having closures because of snow and uh yeah it's it's all over the state basically i got to shovel my driveway to take this the midwest so i shoveled my driveway during the freezing rain to take my son to hockey last night <laughs> where a bunch of dicks wouldn't wear their masks and uh i had to move because they wouldn't and I didn't want to set a bad example for my son. <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Anyway, sorry. Yeah. Editor. Sorry, David. I don't know where I was going on that ramble. But anyway, I am doing fine. I am chilly. I have my beanie or my toque or my toboggan or whatever you call knitted hats in your part of the world on my head, but it's holding my headphones in my ears. I've got a hot cup of coffee in my Cinema PsyOps bug. And I think the soundproofing in here is probably working as insulation. Okay. Yeah, I've got a nice, I've got a nice big fleece blanket with a cat on top of me and a, and a tea. Ooh. Yeah. And a mug that says Halloween is my Christmas. So <laughs> yeah. yeah, the first the first mug I grabbed was the world's okayest mom mug, and I try not to drink out of that one. Mm. Um and so yes. More fittingly repping. Although this is just an audio format, repping our dear friend, Court, at Cinema PsyOps. Matt is dead to me. Tomorrow is the one-year anniversary of me sending him a message in the middle of a conversation, and he never read it. Nope. Oh, yep. Sorry. I, I wanted to make sure that I wasn't making up stories. I just checked. Yes. So. Okay. All right. Um, you can hear all about that saga a little bit on Cinema PsyOps and some more on Psychosemantic. But basically, Matt, re Matt and I were talking about him coming on the show. Yeah. And then we were in the middle of sorting out the day. And then he just ghosted me. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. So he's not really dead to me, but I am I am petty like that. I keep track of things like that. Mm-hmm. So, I don't know. Like Amanda said, my uh my superhero identity would be Captain Courtesy or Mr. Manners. 
So I get I get weird about things like that and talk about them for 10 minutes in the middle of the intro to a podcast about somebody who also can't get a message to anyone out there. Somebody else who is cold like we are. Um, Paul Sheldon. Yes. In the book and movie Misery. Not to hijack the train, more to just rerail it after I derailed it. True. Back to you, Vanessa. <laughs> Sounds like breaking news. <laughs> the way you <laughs> rolled that back. Right here. Um, the way this you is rolled morning, that back. This is morning wow. coffee here. Yeah. Um, sorry, I'm not quite awake. I was, I, no, I, um, I was watching this before we're recording today. It's in the morning and I had already had a, had tea with caffeine in it, but I was on the couch and I was curled up on the, under the blanket because I was cold had the cat under the blanket with me and we're watching this movie <laughs> with all the snow and ice and i've seen the movie before but it just was making me colder <laughs> and colder and colder when he uh the who's the cinematographer on this uh Barry Sonnenfeld Barry Sonnenfeld yeah i which He's he did a lot of films as a cinematographer before he started directing. Yeah, what um I, I guess I should have checked. Uh oh yeah, so yeah, he directed what Adam's family and the sequel. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I kind of like Get Shorty. I'm not really sure if I should like it as much as I do, but I do. Yeah. I I well, yeah, big um big fan of most of the people in that movie. Um but he, yeah, uh what all did he work on as a cinematographer? A cinematographer? To... Ah, there we go. I've got that list. Raising Arizona, Throw Mama from the Train. Oh, and here's where he met where when Barry met Rob uh, doing cinematography for Harry Met Sally. Yes. The year before they did Misery. Anyway. Um, why was... Oh, he just fills every frame with piles of snow whenever he seems to get the chance. In, oh, I in know. This movie. I know. I, and even... There's certain shots where it's just some of the pine trees are just caked in snow and in ice. Yeah. It's, you know, it was just perfectly. It's that perfect sense of. Yeah, you're stuck. <laughs> you can't go anywhere. Desolation. No, you know how snow, well, you probably remember. It's not the same in, in cities as much it is, as it is out where, what, it's Silver Creek in the movie and Sidewinder in the book? Colorado. But that dampening effect snow has on sound especially out in the mm -hmm. middle of nowhere so it's isolation and i i this I, i'm sorry we we're still in the intro i think or if we started the episode this is this is, you've let me take things out of control vanessa this is all your fault look what you made me do I, I didn't cockamake you do you any cockamake <laughs> make you do anything. Uh, gotta get I my can't even fluid. swear in Annie talk. It's just 
so foreign to me. So bitchly cow corn. I think is one of the things she says in the movie, right? It's hard. It, it is hard it, to keep track. It's so difficult. It's so difficult. It's like, just say the thing. Although she does in both let out a cocksucker near the end. Right. Right. I, it's not as good as, you know, a Kathleen Turner one uh, from Serial Mom, but it's still, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or any other John Waters movie for that matter. But still, yeah. A powerful, her, yes. A powerful for, performance. For Annie. Like. Well, it is pretty amazing when you look at this movie and see that... This was the first time that someone won the Best Actress Oscar for a horror film. Like, for a role in a horror movie. And then oh, the following it? year, Jodie Foster. And, oh. and um, Anthony Hopkins would win for Silence of the Lambs. I mean, previously, um, Ruth Gordon had won Best Supporting Actress for Ru for Rosemary's Baby, but that was the supporting actress role. But still, I mean, it's not like e e horror even gets nominations. It's so rare and it's so sad when you have some of these performances that there's no way about it. You can call this a drama, a thriller, if you want, but it is horror. It is psychological horror. Do they, I think, tone down the movie from what the book is a little bit? I, yeah, I think yeah. so. A, a lot bit in some places. Yeah. But... They keep I think the it's... the final. Well, I guess we 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 can get into. There are some where the basic end result kind of happens, but Rob Reiner is not Stephen King. No, no. And Stephen King is not Rob Reiner, although they like each other. I, this is one of the adaptations that Stephen King isn't upset about. Well. It... Why he he was really he was apparently very hesitant about giving the rights to this to anyone, and when he heard Rob Reiner was asking was one of the people asking, um, he gave he bas he basically decided to work with Rob Reiner because he had liked what Rob Reiner did with Stand by Me. You know, right, which what came from Stephen King's The Body. I forgot which one was first. Yeah, Stand By Me was like... Late 80s? Yeah, it was 87, 88. Mm. What? Uh, screenplay by William Goldman. And we already talked about the cinema. So... We've got James Kahn and Kathy Bates doing a basic almost like a one what would it be called like a one scene play not a one act it, play it's basically you could do this as a stage play and and they talked about it for a long time and apparently julia roberts wanted to star as as annie wilkes yeah mm -hmm. right okay I see that casting. <laughs> well, didn't they also want Julia Roberts to play Harriet Tubman in some fucking movie back around then? Yeah, but yeah. So <laughs> it's like we gotta put Julia Roberts in it. Pretty woman is rocketing to the top, I'm guessing, when they're <sighs> when the when the producer is talking about that. But yeah, no, anyway. No way, no way she could do I wanna see a stage play 
Tony Collette. Speaking of you know people getting snubbed for Oscars, I thought that you might might have been going that way. Well, Tony, that Tony you, Collette, you know my beef, you know my beef there on, with the Oscars and her not getting you know nominated for Hereditary. She's never gotten nominated. I don't think she's ever been nominated. I mean, like she's even when she has a small role in something, she blo- she knocks it out of the park. Yeah. Anyway, back to misery. It, <laughs> they actually were starting to make it a stage play. Laurie Metcalf was cast. Ooh, I could see that. Yeah, and I'm like, I was so on board. I was I was living here in New York when they were working towards that, and. Bruce Willis was going to play the Paul Shelton character. And I was like, okay, I could see that. I he's, I could. He's kind of got the James Caan, you know, that vibe of that Paul Shelton. Yeah. yeah. Right. We not saying you have to have the same feel of the, the actors that played the role before it, obviously. But um, even looking at the book and the way that these actors in this film, they already personified them pretty well, I do, th- I do feel, as far as the casting goes. Yeah. I, if I didn't know better, I could have thought that they were sort of mental images during the writing and i don't know if that's because they do it so well in the movie that all my read readings because i read the book after i saw the movie in, in, initially you know same with me so i don't know if i tried to be objective as much as one can with an opinion <laughs> uh last time around and i still think that they got perfect people to play the roles. Oh, and even just having the small little role of Lauren Bacall as li- literary agent. I mean, you know, nice little classy touch. You have, and can we just talk about in the film, which they don't have them in like this in the book, but I do like, it's a case of the movie did it better. Are you going to talk about Buster and Virginia? Yep, the married sheriff and deputy (laughs) couple. Plus, I love that actress, Mary uh, Sternhagen. Yeah. Or Frances Sternhagen. uh, I think it's That plays Virginia. I've seen her. She's one of those character actresses seen in a bunch of different things. And just... And he... I've seen him, too. But it's just... um, Richard Farnsworth, it, it's just the two of them together. <laughs> and it was just a nice little way of breaking the kind of whatever tension. And I mean, and that's a way of, you know, that's a Rob Reiner kind of touch, I feel. Yes. You know, sort of how he goes back and forth from the the narrator or the uh, the the bullies in uh, Stand by Me, right? You know, when when things are getting really tough on the kids, we get Richard Dreyfus or uh, Kiefer Sutherland as Ace. Yeah. Sorry. Anyway. Uh, yeah. Uh, what was did you say his name was Richard? Farnsworth yeah is and uh Francis Sternhagen yeah Yeah. they they are fun every time I watch this movie it's it's cute it's the the humor of I I mean I I used to think that they were one of those couples that were actually married and they you they are totally they totally have the chemistry that make it so believable when they relate together that okay you don't just see them as like actors acting 
No, they're Buster in Virginia. <laughs> when you're in this vehicle, you they're just not going about life. their day. <laughs> it's they are existing, and I, 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 I love that you feel that even regardless of how they were written or directed, you feel that they've even these actors also have fought the characters out in their heads enough. Even that, even though they're secondary characters, they're very three dimensional. Oh yeah, uh, they've given so them a backstory, and I can see that the two of them as actors may have even worked together to give them a backstory. You know, like oh, as an exercise, that, yeah. you know, just so that they could exude a certain amount of chemistry. And I, mean, I don't know if they did it then, but I mean, they had. About twenty minutes of on, or less of on screen time, so they probably had a lot of time hanging out. Yeah, but there's certain there's certain times where they're just like even little like small offhanded comments that are said in their shared screen time, not even their bigger, you know, scenes, and. You feel that they you feel that they really do actually have a relationship. Uh, whereas reportedly, like James Kahn and Kathy Bates butted heads as far as their just acting styles went. She was she was more theater based, right? Right. And she wanted more rehearsal time ahead of time, and he didn't. And basically, the direction given to Kathy Bates was, as the solution was, use that frustration and channel it towards your character. And how frustrated you are towards Paul Shelton. <laughs> and it's kind of like, okay. Yeah. And it, it it works. It works. And because they don't need to have the chemistry that Buster and Virginia need to have. <laughs> yeah. They're supposed to, yeah, exactly. They wouldn't and have that. I think they also uh I can't remember who said it. Uh did you did you ever uh you you how did you watch this? You did you watch this on Showtime? Yeah. Have you ever watched it with the commentary? Um, I don't remember. I might have. I can't remember. I owned, it, I owned it at one point, and I don't know where my copy is. Ah. I, I, re, uh, I think I said this when we were picking it in, in the last episode, but I revisited it um, for the 1990s podcast under the stairs summer series. And that was the last time I watched it with commentary. But so one person on there said that they intentionally kept James Kahn in the bed for longer than he really needed to, to yeah. get him frustrated and pissed off. Yeah. Um, um, so they were all channeling their onset uh, frustrations at each other. And... And then we, like we were saying, we've got Buster in Virginia. It's bright out. They're outside a lot. They're enjoying each other's company. They are playful. They are fun. And they, yeah, like you said, they they really fleshed out these characters for being the the sort of the tension breakers. Because... You know, in the in the book, like you said, it's it's different law enforcement. Right. I mean, it's it's two male officers, but it or isn't it multi jurisdictions? Yeah. The I think they break it up in the book. The it's broken up. Uh, I don't know if it's state and federal. Or highway and local. No, it, it's county and um, state or state, something. State troop. Yeah, one of the was it 
county officers showed up together and the uh the state trooper that gets the lawnmower treatment was by themselves. Yeah. Or is okay. Uh, so got a very different kills. Well, I, I mean the wheel the one thing I, I, I will say about the book um is that uh it, the kill count is definitely higher. <laughs> yes. Um and I mean, you know, you you can only I know you can only do so much in a movie that they're trying to they it was like an hour and fifty minute movie. Right. Uh yeah, so it was under two hours, I remember that. It it's just under that, and they didn't really add that much into the movie. That's not in the book. You know? The really the only thing... Yeah, there's not much of anything. There's not much that's added. No, it's, it's more streamlined. And there's... Stuff... Yeah, stuff, stuff cut out. There's... They didn't do the... All the misery scenes that you get in the book. Yeah. Which would have broken it up but they have done that before uh i also think lauren bacall is in this isn't she kathleen turner's friend in romancing the stone or her agent oh maybe i don't remember um it's been so long since i've seen that no no it's uh holland taylor plays her agent another powerful slender woman from uh I'm trying to think of something that you would have anyway sorry it was not lauren mccall uh but they <laughs> for a movie i haven't seen in about 15 years they look enough alike but anyway in romancing the stone they will cut away to scenes from Kathleen Turner's romance novel with her playing the main character. Yeah. And that, that probably would have broken up. Well, it would have made the movie way too long and it would have been sort of, I think extra compared to, you know, we we've already got Buster in Virginia to, show the outside world and get us away from the tension. Um, well, there were a couple other differences I noticed. Yeah, but of, you of also course. need Buster and Virginia to tie to the search for Paul Sheldon. So that like does serve a dual purpose. You know? So it's like, okay, we'll follow them along as, you know, as we do this other stuff. Fair point. Yeah, I forgot about um, Just self serve that serve multiple purposes. But um, what was I going to say? Um, but for the most part, you could pl you could do this as a stage play with just the two actors. I mean, truthfully. Uh, you know, with ju and just have a certain amount of, you know, hear certain things. I mean, maybe have, like, two law enforcement people come in you know, just to be killed. But that's it. Right. Like, just to have them appear shortly or something. Uh... <laughs> you could have a pre-recorded voice, you know, even be the people off stage. You know, if you're gonna, if you're if you're 
you know, tight on like the amount of cast members you have or budget you have, you know, it depends on how far off Broadway you're talking. <laughs> a, a bed, a table, a typewriter. I guess one different room for the uh, for the escapes. I think there's more. There are more escapes. There are more leaving the room in the book, and yes, they the Annie's absences are more obvious and lengthy. Yes, they are, and you know, and she. She doesn't approach him about it as quickly. You know. About, about her true About intentions. his absences from the room. Yeah. Like his escapes. Yeah. That, and that then this, is... you know, and also goes into like, well... I thought that you had escaped from the room and, you know, and talking about how she knew and like how she could tell all these things and then how she had purposely put the scrapbook out hoping he would see it and all this stuff. Like that, there's all this dialogue that just turned around in the movie. A penguin always faces due south. Yeah, it, I mean, it's just was your key. Sorry, just thinking of great, great lines from both. I also, well, I, I don't want to change the subject already, but the the escape, yeah, the the attempted escapes and the there's both both Reiner and King in their own ways, tremendous tension building. Oh, absolutely, and that's what yeah I, I that's what what works is that Reiner has his own way of building tension that on I don't remem remember if it was last time we recorded if we actually got it when we were recording or not but I we had the conversation come up between us about how Rob Reiner here he directs this which is a horror movie you know and he had directed Stand By Me which was a drama kind of horror you know thriller um, and but most people think of him as a comedic director more the Spinal Tap and Harry Met Sally and um in a league of their own did he do a league of their own? I thought that was Penny Marshall. Oh, that was Penny Marshall. Thank you. Sorry. No, I mean I could see him doing that. Uh what else? I forgot. I forgot. No. I was trying to remember. I was trying to go through off the top of my head, but yeah, Princess Bride, like, you know, those kinds of things, like, you know. Uh, yeah, I mean, and, well, he came uh, even but more he did... originally. He was on that show, All in the Family, which was not a scary, well, I guess it could be scary. Archie Bunker can, uh, can be, but he was the comic relief to start. And then, well, yeah, right. he, he himself... I, I think especially in his acting roles also is more tied to comedy. Yeah, because when you, after this, what does he go on to direct? He directs A Few Good Men. Um, you know, Ghosts of Mississippi. he did Ghosts of Mississippi a couple years after that, yeah. Yeah, which pretty heavy in their own way. I mean, Stand By Me was too. Uh, but that one, yeah, that was 
the Ghost of Miss that was that was the one about Medgar Evers, right? With uh, Alec yeah. Baldwin and Whoopi Goldberg and James Woods. That's right. I haven't seen that in a while. Yeah, but maybe you're right it, it, that it is his acting that is. Um, people tie him more to comedy and you know and also his his father's comedic legacy oh right carl was his dad right yeah best friends with mel brooks yeah uh, but yeah so many comedic roles he was in mixed nuts which i i watched um yeah over the christmas time I know I have a I have a soft spot for that movie. It's it's just kind of a quirky little movie. Yep, just happens to take place around Christmas. Right. That was Liev Schreiber's first movie. I'm pretty sure. Early. Um, but yeah, Carl Ryan. I mean, and also, I mean, Stephen King also is in real life especially now that he has gotten rid of the annie wilkes in his brain um a general fun loving kind of kind of guy I, I think we talked about if you had read that stephen king autobiography on writing mm -hmm. and you said you hadn't correct I, I've I've read part of it. Okay, but had you read the part where he talked about misery? It's been so long. So okay. refresh my memory. Maybe maybe you had. But the it, it initially started out as a short story. Mm -hmm. Where at the end Annie was going to kill Paul, skin him, and bind the special version of memory that she made him write in his skin and uh he realized that as he was deciding to make it into uh, a novel or a novella he couldn't make people read certain hundreds of pages just for that to happen so that's that's why that changed i think he yeah. came up with the idea after like taking a nap at a Rudyard Kipling desk at some hotel he was staying at. Yeah. And it also part partly Annie Wilkes was inspired by his drug addiction. And okay. feeling feeling like he was held captive by I think this one's more specifically the the cocaine problem. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't mean to snort at that, but I just pictured him uh, talking about maximum overdrive. Uh, <laughs> but I, I, I it was <laughs> like the angry, forceful thing making him right and sort of keeping him stuck with metaphorical broken legs or you know broken yeah. bones, like just being held captive by his his problem. Uh, yeah. He said that's at least part part of the inspiration for that, and um, that's all I really remember from that. Well, you know how um, we were taught we we were saying earlier that uh, you know who was in mind for the characters, casting wise. Steve, and how because of how well they were cast mm -hmm. because K Stephen King was so impressed with Kathy Bates and her job as Annie in this film he specifically wrote the roles in Dolores Claiborne and uh, The Stand with her in mind that's cool yeah you know, I don't think I've seen Dolores Claiborne. 
It's I am aware uh, of it. Kathy Bates is in it with Jennifer Jason Lee. Yeah. It's actually um I I liked it. Uh but I it's been so long since I've seen it that I feel like I need to rewatch it. It's 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 got a different kind of feel to it. Um uh, Yeah. 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 I... Yeah, I, I'm aware enough of it to sort of I'm, um, have as much of a gist as as if I had read the back of the box. Uh, Amanda's seen it a few times, mm -hmm. but I don't think, yeah, I never watched that with her. And, oh, Kat, and scary. And that uh, just... When she's holding the the sledgehammer and saying "I love you," and the quick, the yeah, I guess I don't know. There's probably a better word than quick, but just the way she just flips into the rage, like the I think rage? sometimes described like a charging bull in the book. Yeah. Well, just it's like flipping a switch though yeah. where she just becomes unhinged so quickly <laughs> i know that mr man i know well that's one of my favorites mr man <laughs> <laughs> they're also called chapter plays <laughs> where is she from kathy bates but um know. But anyway, and um, yeah, it's just, she just is perfect, you know, as far as like flipping on a dime. And you see the, I, I will, there's not much in like, in horror and, and that kind of thing that makes me like flinch. And they're both in Stephen King movies or adaptation of Stephen King books. And they're both with the ankles because I have a bad his. I have my own history of ankle problems. Okay. I had reconstructive surgery on one of my ankles when I was 16. Like I've just, I've done everything except break an ankle. But I, uh, so the hobbling, <laughs> it just, oh, that first blow when you see it. And it just, I cringe every single time I see that. Oh my goodness. That... It's kind of like in Pet Cemetery, the original one. Judd's where ankle. it goes for <laughs> the scalpel and the Achilles tendon. It's, you know, little zombie gauge. It's just uh, those those things. That's real. It seems like real kind of pain to me. Yes. And well, much more feasible than so much other stuff you see on screen. Totally. And the especially uh it's been a while since I've seen Pet Cemetery. But I can clear as soon as you said one of them was not in this one and it had to do with ankles, I knew what you were talking about. And in this, I mean, you know who did special effects for misery. Perhaps. Who was it? It was uh, Greg Nicotero. Oh. I didn't realize that. He did. He did the special effects, and um, they did. I'm pretty sure they shot both ankles happening, but they decided to only use the one because they figured that was more than enough. Well, honestly, seeing one is all you need to see imagining the second is worse than actually seeing it to tell you the truth 
it's probably more effective. And I think visually it was just as brutal as what happened. Yeah, they made their point. Yeah. They made their point. And I think if they did what was in the book, it might have not worked as well. Right. And but yes, watching the the ankle bend bend over the uh, Because I'll tell mm -hmm. you. Sorry. I am overly flexible. Reaction already. Yeah. With my I'm overly flexible with my ankles. And my ankles bend all crazy ways. Like ways that they shouldn't. And it reminded me a little too much of my own after I've entered my own. And I just know some of that pain. And, ah, that's part of it. I think that's why it actually gets to me. Is because I can just relate to it on a personal level. You know, it's... Oh, I even mean, though, that is no, scene. I've never... Pardon? I was just saying say, that, that, that is just a scene that... Even if somebody hasn't seen the movie, they know about. Oh, right, right. No, I, re I remember, too, seeing it in the movie theater and the audience's reaction to that scene. Was it gasps? Oh, the collective gasp for the audience was actually kind of amazing. Just that to me, that. That tells you you have a film that knows how to make you actually viscerally react, for better or worse, you know. Right. It knows how to induce something and, and a reaction in you. Yeah, that is a, a, a literal and metaphorical for, well, not metaphorical, but, you know, He's almost healed. <laughs> He's closer to being healed. He is his his body and his life has been hobbled in that moment. Right. And I think that the the Annie Wilkes line is only changed a little bit from book to movie for that part to correspond with the action. But mm -hmm. that yeah, um, I don't know. Anyway, just flabbergasted and mentally pained just to picture it over and over again. I'm kind of tripping over my words. It's a brutal scene. Had to be talked about. Yeah. Burned into everyone's memory right now. And yeah, well, it's, I, I figured that it was... Uh, Oh, well, I mean, Rob Reiner could get whoever, but it seemed like a well-seasoned horror movie type special effects person did those ankles. Well, not just the ankles. Even before that, look at all the bruising and the veins on the legs from when Paul has is just in the recovery stage of the accident i mean that's really good work if you have ever seen someone who is you know had something like that happen to them that is very true that's very realistic and that's i think too many movies mess it up because it's easy to mess up, actually. It's very easy to mess up. And if you don't care enough about it, or if you don't know how to do it right, you're not going to know how to do it to make it look realistic. And, you know, you start by that in this, and that alone, not even just, okay, come the scene where the hobbling scene <laughs> you know yeah a lot of attention to detail uh it seems to be sort of a a hallmark of that tom savini school of special effects that nicotero came from mm -hmm. 
the realism, no matter what your budget, if you can make it look as real as possible. And right. I mean, because truthfully, it's just a matter of very simple practical effects for that. You don't need a big budget for that part of it. You're, you, need you know, brush and paint. <laughs> Right, exactly. You just need someone who knows how to apply the makeup and paint correctly, you know. So, um, yeah, then you have your big, then you have more money to play with for, you know, when you do need to have your effects like <laughs> those ankles, like ah. <laughs> the ankles, the the head cast of Kathy Bates for the typewriter yeah. scene. Right. Put some squibs on Buster. And... and and by the way, I thought I'd mention since, you know, we do have in the cast here Misery the Pig played by self. Or <laughs> yes, it just says Misery the Pig is the 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 pig's actual name. But in real life, but I suspect the pig had a different name. But uh, I did actually work on this horrible, whatever, not even good enough to be a B movie. But I had to do a costume for a pig. <laughs> oh, <laughs> that was yeah. in the movie. Yeah. Yep. And it was it was when I had to do the fitting. It was right after the pig got fixed and or like or was at the vet getting ready to get fixed and like the pig like hated me and it was just it was just miserable and all of this stuff and then come time of the shoot i was the only one that the pig liked <laughs> <laughs> like didn't even so i had to sit off camera like not even like with like treats or anything just sit there just company to keep the, to keep the pig calm it was kind of funny pig wrangler i know okay, what else i did also notice this time around as will happen with stephen king things yeah uh you know the their near side winder and they right. reference they reference the overlook right well by by situation not i don't think they i don't think by name and uh paul they... was talking about his neighbor mrs casprack i thought in the book they mentioned the overlook by name did they maybe they did i just remember in the that... book in the book yeah all i remembered from the book was talking about the caretaker of a nearby hotel going crazy and uh maybe or, they didn't uh, reference the name i thought they did i i guess i should should have paid closer attention to that but i, yeah. I did note that uh when paul was talking about when he got caught smoking when he was younger he had taken cigarettes from his neighbor mrs casprack which mm -hmm is eddie casprack as a character in it yep and he I, I don't know if his mom smokes in that but it, it's stephen king so there's so much connectivity i don't know if it's just one of those things or if they are all connected i never watched that castle rock show i think i watched an episode or two of it and i never read the dark tower but uh comment um yeah no there it, it, as always there are these little easter eggs like that yeah i noticed that too i mean you can't help but it, it because that's just how stephen king creates his universe you know um yeah um i'm trying to think if there's anything else but i think covered most of it i mean yes we've said that there are some differences uh book definitely a little bit more brutal 
but as, as you can get away with easier in a book than an MPAA rated movie, especially coming yeah. out of it, coming out of the eighties into the, the nineties. Um, yeah, I, but I don't know if Rob Reiner would have made a more brutal version of the film. He seemed happy. No, with I don't did. think so. I don't see him going in. Yeah. Doing something more brutal, but I think this is, I mean, this was fine because it's, you get the idea of what's going on. Um, it's as far as how it compares to the book, you know, it, it has the spirit of the book, you know, like I said, I mean, earlier, the, the cast is very, you know, is, is very well cast. Well cast, well executed, well cinematographied. <laughs> the the music, uh, uh, and the soundtrack. Mm -hmm. I feel like they picked music. Uh, what what the music like James Caan is listening to, driving. I feel like I've seen Stephen King quote lyrics from in one of his books. Maybe Christine. I, I was, yeah, I was. I thought the same thing. Um. I feel like he's he's had that song in other in uh, other writing, which I don't know if it's just because he likes a lot of good music, or people are like, I I don't want Stephen King to get mad at me, so I'm going to put some music he likes in there because <laughs> I want to be able to do more more of his movies. Well, I think it's a matter of knowing. Stephen King's style because it's something that would exist in the Stephen King universe as as you're saying yeah where yes stand by me exists yes where misery exists yes where you know it exists yes where the shining exists and and all these other things like that have can that can have tiebacks to something else like i forget what it is that has a tie back to carry i mean like you know there's it's so a, many yeah. different things that are just interwoven and if even there's that just shows that it makes sense that it's kind of like okay it feels more authentic as far as being a Stephen King kind of thing. Yeah, you know? they didn't wipe his fingerprints from this. I can't really think of anything right off the top of my head right. that anybody really did. I know he wasn't happy, notoriously wasn't happy about the Kubrick's The Shining, but uh, I don't think anybody intentionally said, oh, I want to get rid of all of this Stephen Kingness." from this source material yeah. but some play closer homage to the king <laughs> well in the fact but the fact that well clearly stephen king proved he couldn't do that with maximum overdrive because well cocaine for one <laughs> but also just is stephen king just couldn't do that himself and that was that was just a crazy a mess anyway we've talked about that movie before on this show but um just think like in between the shining coming out in 1980 and then this coming out 1990 okay the only other one, like I said, Maximum Overdrive, and then what was the other one? There was another one that was, because more of them were really coming out in the early 90s, but the only other one I can really think of is is um, Stand By Me, you know? Yeah. Um... And that, oh, well, Running Man, I mean, if you want to, if you count that. Yeah, but, but <laughs> the Bachman Stephen King. Right. Um, yeah, well, okay, so I have... And I know, a... I, I think there was probably another one, but 
when did the first pet cemetery come out that might have been 89 that was 89 yeah yeah and i don't think stephen king was like he also (laughs) yeah he i think he liked some aspects but overall he was kind of like i don't know i think he was okay with the dead zone um (laughs) and i well just because he was in one doesn't mean that he likes it but you know he was in uh the creep show children of the corn yeah that one i keep hearing is not as good on revisit i haven't seen that since i was a kid I haven't seen Children in the Corn in a while, but I do. That's one that ha- I have a soft spot for. I can't watch like the sequels. Like I just can't. It's I've only gotten to like the third, and I'm like after that, I'm like just no stop. Um, if you watch the Stacy Keach scenes from Children of the Corn six six six, uh huh. That's probably the best part of that movie. Is uh, are, are are the Stacy Keach scenes, and the oh, one I would bef- imagine so. The one before that, Children of the Corn Five, has uh like David Carradine and Kane Hodder and I believe Alexis Arquette and um I think Eva Mendez. Uh-huh. Uh, just a whole bunch of uh, Ken Forhey, maybe or not Ken Forhey. Uh, shit, but th- th- there were a that movie should have been better considering the people that were in it. But yeah. um, I hadn't seen that forever. I did that one with Desmond. Yeah. On uh, when there was still a pretty regular podcast. I I think they're mostly YouTube these days. Right. Um, but anyway, Stephen King, uh, Children of the Corn. Uh, yeah, we talked about Maximum Overdrive. I, I think Needful Things was the first Stephen King movie I saw in the theater. Mm. And that one was, uh, you know, it was really cool for a 11 or 12 year old or however I was when that came out. Um I'm trying to, yeah, I mean, I pretty much every Stephen King thing's been. Oh, I had a weird date and saw a Secret Window. It was like a blind date or something <laughs> like that. And she picked Secret Window. Oh, uh, God. <laughs> we only went out once. Um,. <laughs> Um, I still need to see the director's cut of Dr. Sleep. Yeah, me too. I, I saw the, the, uh, theatrical cut because when it came out, I saw it in the theater, but I didn't, um, I have not seen the director's cut. So people raved about it. I have it, but I have not sat down to watch it. Um, but I don't know, uh, you, you were kind of, before I derailed us again, you were saying you think that you've said all that you've had to say? Um, yeah, pretty much. I mean, that's all I can think of about this cock duty movie. <laughs> you know, I just had to throw that in there for good measure. Exactly. Uh, the I, mean, I think that was one of the better. Uh, I I do think it is one of the better adaptations, as far as what I've read, and and also just a movie that I know is from adapt adapted from King's work. It still has a Stephen King feel to it. You know what I mean? Um, Like, I mean, that said, I love Kubrick's The Shining, even though it feels more Kubrick than King. 
It does, but I like it more than the King Approved version with the dude from Wings. I, oh, I, I don't like that at all because it, I, it's a casting thing. I I just don't like him in that role. It's much more faithful to the book. I will give it that, but that's all I give it. But casting goes a long way. Yeah. I I, th I think the only thing, and it's it was a Kubrick and Nicholson thing, but there is no real slow degradation of Jack to insanity. It's since they are who they are, it's kind of like Jack is already fucking nuts and he just loses it by the end of the movie. Yeah. You know? But otherwise, I mean, yeah. I, I don't know. We almost talked about that, but the book was a bit too long to to deal with. I think that was I think that didn't get cut from the last episode. Us almost they're saying that we won't do that then. Or did we? I can't remember. I don't remember. Must be but, all those um, painkillers. Paul Sheldon slipped into my drink. Make yep. it oogie. All right. Is that what she says? I'm feeling all oogie. Not from the painkillers, but when she talks about feeling off. Give me a bag of that effing pig feed and 10 pounds of that bitchly cow corn. It's a big bastard of a check, they said to Stephen King when they wanted to adapt his movie Misery or his book into a movie. And surprise, surprise. We like the book and the movie at VD Clinic, I would guess. I would definitely say that <laughs> yeah, I would you... surprisingly recommend both. Well, it, but it's not just that. It's it's the rare occasion where you have that you can't say, oh, I'm going to definitely recommend the book over the movie or the movie over the book. Yeah, take your pick, whichever one you want to do first, but then do the other one if you haven't. Yeah, exactly. I mean, because it's such, and, and, and some people would say, well, if it's such a good, faithful adaptation, wouldn't it just be duplication? But no, they're not exactly the same, but it, the movie has what it is that is different is just like we said it captures the spirit of the book and um yeah it's it's just it's worth it the the writing is worth it too because this was also you know king being on his game cuz sometimes you know king is just kind of all over the place yeah, sometimes uh, you get things that he doesn't remember writing, like Cujo, which is a little streaky. Right. At least I think that's the one he said he doesn't remember writing. I think so. But yeah. Uh, a little bit more isolation to your your January, if you're listening to this and it's release month. Or yes. And... And to continue our Stephen King, I wanted to say, I have a book giveaway. Aha! Segways! Segway. Exactly. Um, so, why don't we take a small break? I'll announce the book giveaway. What's it coming up next month? And close this show. Okay, be back in a minute. Fay Ray. Ah! Janet Lee. Ah! Adrian King. Ah! Heather Langenkamp. Ah! Amy Steele. Ah! That weatherman who saw the cockroach. That oh my God! Jamie Lee Curtis. <laughs> and you. Come on. You know you wanna. Let her rip. <laughs> oh my god! There. 
Now don't you feel better? You are now officially a Scream Queen. Come play with the rest of us at www.screamqueens.com. That's Queens with a Z. Or you could subscribe to us on iTunes. Either way, it's going to be fucking fabulous. The Scream Queens Horror Podcast. It's where horror gets bent. Okay, and we are back. So, our book giveaway to the, um, it will be, so you will need to email us at vdclinicpod. What's that email, Darren? That one should be vdclinicpod at gmail.com. Yes. Exactly. And we will be giving away a copy of Stephen King's The Drawing of the Three, the second in the Dark Tower series. <laughs> Remember Ooh. back when David was going to make me read those? Uh, this seems is like from ages I, ago. Yeah, this is from when I bought the book and I started reading it. And yes, so. So some lucky person who emails us, um, please. And, you know, we will draw it random. So please um, send that in. And I guess by the end of February, make sure. sure to give enough people enough time. Sound good, Darren? That sounds good. And you said it just email, nothing yep. specific. No, just, just say, hey. say your name and say, I would like to enter the book giveaway, the Stephen King book giveaway. All right. That should be plenty of time for someone to enter. Yep. Just make sure to include your name and say, hi. My name is so and so. I would like to enter the book giveaway. I can guess a couple names that might be on there, but I don't want to say them out loud just yes. in case. Yes, exactly. So that is my announcement. Darren, what um yes. is coming up for us for February? Okay, so February we will be doing um let me pull it. I guess it's easy enough to differentiate, but we will be doing 2021's Candyman. Do we want to say why, or is it obvious for us, or just leave it you at that? You can say why if you want. Ah, no, but we'll talk about it then. If anybody, well, I can say it now. I don't know. Sorry. I had two really big coffees right before we started recording and this is where I am now. <laughs> uh, but yeah, February is the shortest month. So that is why the people in power decided to make it women in horror and black history month. Well, I don't know what powerful people made it women in horror month, but it seems like marginalized people boys. get the short, get the short months. The fanboys decided that. Ah, so the white cis yeah male but, hetero one but it's candy male. man and it's anybody familiar with the original story and then there's it's directed by nia da costa and i've been looking for a reason to sit down and watch it so no time like the present right Yes, you have no excuse, Darren. Nope, I need to. And I think I might even have the edition of Books of Blood that has the original story in it, but I'm not sure. Forbidden? Yeah. yeah forbidden. Yeah. I haven't. Yeah, it's been a long time since I've read that. Yeah, I've got two or three of the volumes. And I, I would be the type of person that would skip ahead to read a story that I'm more familiar with. <laughs> but 
it's been a while. I've been doing so much of my reading in either audiobook or comic book form mm -hmm. that I haven't looked at the shelves in the room that Amanda has basically turned into her office since she's uh, still working from home. Um, there are two big bookshelves in there, and they're on there somewhere. Anyway, yes, February, we are doing the 2021 version of Candyman and talking okay. about all that therein. And then are we saying the theme that uh, you have chosen for March Madness, or are we, we, we waiting until next time? Oh, we can just tease it and say it's a little Manson, but not necessarily what you're thinking of. We're doing the South Park episode about <laughs> Charlie Manson. <laughs> Oops. Edit that out, David. <laughs> Wouldn't that be funny if we did do that? <laughs> but that's not it. Oh, <laughs> so there you go. Let your imaginations run wild like the second snapping sound of the ankle around the fence post or whatever she uses to brace. I know whatever piece, whatever firewood or something she brings in. Yeah. Yikes. Anyway. Anywho, <laughs> give me the heebie-jeebies, Darren. Why don't you? <laughs> Kick off the day with some, yes, some trauma. And I hope the rest of your day, dear listener, is better than Paul Sheldon's. That is true. And um, hopefully warmer. <laughs> okay. Anything else to say, Darren? What else do you nope. have going on these days? Uh, let's see. Uh, over at Psycho Semantic, got a couple epi episodes. You know, I don't like to necessarily say before they're recorded, but um, got another couple things lined up. And I think coming out uh, next is something that has been recorded uh, by the time you hear this episode the most recent episode should be me and Mark Ball talking about the non-Sylvester Stallone version movie adaptation of Judge Dredd okie dokie uh, yes the Carl Urban Judge Dredd so yeah and if you're listening to this in whatever time there will be other things out because you are not tied to our timeline. Thank you for listening whenever you are. I get it. I get it. Um, I'm trying to think of anything I have to promote. Oh, yeah. I was, I did an episode of uh, Badasses, Boobs, and Body Counts um, early January with um i <laughs> instead of iris being there vanessa was asked to step in no, no. <laughs> as i joked about when iris um, was on our show oh uh, no but uh i was uh iris was not there it was just um mark um mike and myself and we missed you, but we covered Peter Jackson's um, Brain Dead. That was fun. Um, yeah, that's all I've had going on outside of BD Clinic. I might have something coming up for February mm -hmm. outside of this show, but I don't know when that will happen yet. So stay, stay tuned. tuned. <laughs> yeah, that's it. Later, cockadoodie brats. What? I said, talk to you later, cockadoodie brats. Okay. Same to you. <laughs> oh, you. Well, no, I was calling everyone else a cockadoodie brat. Okay. Uh, 
Not you. Is that your your way your weird way of trying to close out the show, Darren? Oh no, I I would never try to be the last word on this. That's a that's a that's up for you. I don't know why, but it's just we're very bad at the closing out the show. So I guess this what is our chance to um and Darren is wired on way too much caffeine. So um I will say goodbye. And uh, until next time, Darren. Bye. Thank you for listening to another episode of the VD Clinic. If you'd like to get in touch with us, you can find us at Twitter at VD Clinic Pod or reach us via email at VD Clinic Pod at gmail.com. We also have a Facebook group, VD Clinic Podcast. We'd love to hear your feedback, suggestions, and more.